I'm so happy you were able to tune in today. And, you know, we just wrapped up our series on finishing the race, staying the course and finishing the race. That has been such a blessing to me. And I'm telling you today when I, well, as the week progressed, I was just kind of seeking God about what to talk about today and what to teach on today and what to speak about. And I, quite frankly, I kept thinking, well, you know, if people can't put their past behind them and if they can't let go of regrets, which I've talked on before, I kept thinking, well, if they can't do that, it's going to be relatively difficult for them to move forward. So me within my own self, that's what I wanted to talk about. That's what I wanted to kind of address and speak on. But I never got a release in my spirit to do that. So finally, last night I was talking to God about some things, and he said, you know, all of that is nothing if people don't learn the reality and the true meaning of integrity, and integrity being a force of life, and if they don't understand what integrity as a force means. So I, I thought, well, yeah, integrity is a, a hugely lacking attribute and quality in today's society. And it's so sad, but I kept, you know, so I kept trying to go down one track and God kept saying no, but people need to hear about integrity. And then I thought, well, you know, God, but who, who hasn't heard about integrity? And you talk to them about integrity, but if people don't want to do right, then they're not going to do right. And so, of course, in the end of the discussion, he won. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about an integrity a force of life. And what I'm going to attempt to do in, the, in a very short session is give you the def definition of integrity, talk you, to you a little bit about integrity, and explain to you and point some scriptures out to you in the word of God regarding integrity. And the funny thing about it, the more I thought on this word, I thought about some things that I've dealt with in my life. And you know, when I got ready to go back to school to get my master's, I had to have like three letters of recommendation. And then, of course, in today's climate and society, when you get ready to go and look, job hunt or look for a job, it's good to have a letter of integrity. And so I call, you know, call a couple of mentors and pe few people who are in positions that society would consider really upper level positions in different companies. And as I read them, the two things that were consistent that everybody said, and I probably had about four, maybe five written, that everybody said was they spoke to my character and they spoke to my integrity. Now, they spoke about the work ethic and those things, but the things that were most important to me was the consistency and the things they said about my character and my integrity. And one, a friend of mine who, um, we're very close, we've been close for a long time, and she's a, you know, pretty high up in her company. She was reading one of the letters, and she said, wow, this is so true. And she started talking about my character and, and, and my integrity. And, and I'm not saying that to impress you. I'm saying this to impress upon you the importance of, in, of integrity and character because for me, and I said all that to say, for me, at the end of everything everybody said about my work ethic and everything that was said about everything else, the thing that was most important to me was the character part. And the thing that was most important to me was the integrity part. So I don't know why it was so difficult for me to understand or get why God wanted me to talk about integrity because the one thing I know is regardless of what you go through in life, regardless of what you face in life, what, what, regardless of what is done to you fairly or unfairly in life, when you are established an in integrity, no, at the end of the day, you will win. Because the only way to establish your life and to remain established is through integrity. That's the only way you're going to do it. And so we're going to talk about this. And, and the first thing I want to address is who needs integrity? Well, I think that integrity has to be an integral part of your life. It's, it has to be an integral part of your life because as far as the word of God is concerned, the principles are concerned, integrity brings blessings. The result, not having integrity, will almost always end in destruction unless you turn it around. Because as I said a few minutes ago, the only way to establish yourself and to stay established is going to be through integrity. I don't care if you're building a company. I don't care if you're the CEO. I don't of a of a huge organization. 
I don't care if you're in ministry. It doesn't matter what you're venturing out to do. The only way to establish yourself and to remain established and to establish yourself on a solid foundation is going to be through integrity. There is no other way. You say, well, better that takes forever. It's just, that's just a, such a long road. And that's just a, it's such a difficult road. First of all, it's not difficult. The only reason you think it's difficult is because you've seen so many people do it the other way. But what I can promise you, and if you look at the people that you've seen do it the other way, you'll see that it didn't last. And if it did last, they had to continue to operate in, in just everything opposite of the way God would have us to handle things. And, and the bottom line is, if you're going to handle things the kingdom of God's way, you, which is the only way you're going to establish yourself and remain established, you're going to have to do it through integrity. Amen. So you reject integrity is going to always, uh, almost always end in destruction, in destruction. Now, what the Webster's definition of integrity is uprightness, virtue, and or honesty. The Bible meaning goes a little deeper. The biblical meaning for integrity is fairness, straightforwardness of conduct. It sticks to the facts. In other words, it's more than just a refusal to lie. It's a refusal to deceive or mislead. It's a refusal to steal, cheat, or manipulate. You never have to wonder if what the person is saying means what they say. And you never have to wonder if they're leaving out a piece or if they're being deceitful or if, you know, this is really where the direction that everything is going because you can trust what they say. Now, the power of integrity, what God's word have to say about integrity, it has quite a bit to say, quite frankly. I was, you know, and it's funny, and I consider myself, a, I consider myself a reader anyway. And when it comes to the word of God, I really consider myself just a scholar as far as reading the word is concerned because I enjoy it. I enjoy the demonstrations that's given in the in the word. I enjoy the different accounts of everybody's li different lives that that's given in the word. So it's, I just really enjoy reading it. So our lives should be guided by integrity. And let's go to and the first scripture I want to go to today is going to be Proverbs, Proverbs 11. And we're going to look at chapter three. And I'm going to get my glasses so I don't have to stand here and squint all morning, all day. I'm still getting accustomed to my new podium. Okay, there are the words. <laughs> what did I say? Proverbs chapter 11. And three, the integrity of the upright shall guide them, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. That basically speaks to what I just said. And that is, if you're not operating in integrity, God's way is going to almost always end in destruction. And the only reason I'm saying the almost part is because I trust that as we grow in God and we grow in the word of God, we're going to choose and everybody's going to choose to do this thing God's way. And when I say everybody, I'm talking about everybody who everybody who has an ear to hear will hear and we'll add here and we'll execute. Those are the people that I'm talking about. I'm talking about the people who want to do the right thing. I'm not talking about, you know, people who they know that we've been made the righteousness of God. They know that we're born again. They know that God loves us. So they use this as an occasion to sin. I'm not talking about, it's one thing to make a mistake or it's one thing to mess up, but it's another thing to live in that mess. So I'm not talking about pe people who prefer living in the mess. I'm talking about those of us who we're not looking for a way to sin. We're looking for ways out of sin. Because quite frankly, I think that's the way Christians are. I think Christians are not looking for a way to sin. We're looking for ways to not sin. And that's why it's important for us to know the righteousness of God. And that's why it's important for us as Christians to know that God loves us regardless. So when you choose to live a life of, of honesty, straightforwardness, and sincerity, those qualities will guide you through treacherous 
times. And when I say treacherous times, we're going to go to Genesis and look at that. They're going to give you're going to have plenty of opportunity, especially after hearing this message. You're going to have plenty of opportunity to not operate in integrity. You're going to have plenty of opportunity to not be straightforward, to not be honest, to not deal wisely in your choices and into your decisions and businesses to be honest and all walk in integrity. You're going to have a lot of opportunities to do that. So I'm going to encourage you and I'm going to to advise you to not do that, to choose to walk in integrity instead. Even when it looks like it may be easier just to not be honest, be honest anyway, because when you do that, God has your back regardless of what it looks like. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 20. And we are going to look at verse 1, Genesis 20, verse 1. As a matter of fact, we're going to look at 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 1, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 20, verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelled between Kadesh and Shur and sojourned in Gerar. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Now, let me just set this up for you a little bit and give you some history. Back in these days, if a king saw a female that he wanted, he could send for her and take her and and to his and take her, basically, and, you know, do what he will. And. He even had the power and oftentimes kings who were treacherous, they would have the husbands killed. So what has happened here is Abraham and Sarah, Sarah have come up with this idea because after all, they don't, they obviously didn't know this king. So they came up with this idea. Okay, Sarah, I'm, I'm, I'm acting as Abraham. He says to Sarah, okay, well, Sarah, you know, you're a beautiful woman and all the guys want you. So I don't want to die. You love me. You don't want me to die. So I think if we just lie and we'll tell King Abimelech. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Let me pronounce the man's name right. And we tell King Abimelech that you are my sister and I'm your brother. The worst thing that can happen is he does whatever he's going to do. But we end up safe, sound, and leave this place. But we're going to have to do this in order to get out, in, in order to get through this alive, and both of us get through this alive and safe. So she agrees, and so they go to King Abimelech, and they tells him, well, they tell he tells her, well, yeah, this is my sister, I'm her brother, and I'm Abraham. This is Sarah. We're we're siblings, basically. So in verse three, Abimelech now is asleep. So it reads, but God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him behold thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken for she is a man's wife now you talk about a wake-up call but to somebody who is operating in integrity this is a huge wake-up call because basically at this point now he's thinking that sarah is abraham's sister So imagine you doing one thing, you think you're on track and you're just happy about the fact that you've made this decision to walk in integrity and you're operating in integrity and you're operating in character. So you made a decision that you've not executed yet. You've made a plan, but the plan has not been executed because that's what's happening here. And Bimelech has made the plan to be with Sarah, but he's not executed it yet. He's asleep. And God comes to him while he's asleep and basically said, you've messed up. And, and you, you go, if you go through with this, you are a dead man. And so, and now in verse four, and Bimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will thou slay also a righteous nation? And in verse five, said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself said, he is my brother in the integrity of my heart. And innocency of my hands have I done this. So Abimelech responded to the Lord, I didn't know. And basically he's saying, okay, you know, God, you're telling me that I'm a dead man, but I didn't know. 
I'm going on what they said. He said that was his sister. She said he was her brother. So I didn't know. And so now based on what I've been told, I'm responding to this. I've walked in integrity. My hands are always going in the direction of integrity. My heart is in the right place. I operate out of character and integrity. And now you're saying that you're going to kill me, that I'm going to die because I'm responding to something that this man and this woman have said. He said, that's my sister. She said, that's my brother. My hands are clean. I've been operating in integrity in my heart. So now here's God's response in verse six. And God said unto him in a dream. Yeah, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thy heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. And this is the powerful thing about God knowing your heart. You know, I hear people say so often, well, you know, and they and they say this when they've done something wrong. And my position on this is it's one thing to do something wrong and it's one thing to mess up and it's one thing to make a mistake. But to continue to make the same mistake over and over after a while, it's not a mistake. You're willingly in sin. You're willingly doing whatever you want to do. And I'm not saying this trying to get you sin conscious, but I'm saying, cause God loves you. What I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying this to try to show you how God does know your heart. So when you do make a mistake or when you're about to make a mistake, because God knows your heart, if you're open to correction, he will correct you. He, and we're going to talk about that later. We're going to talk about how often you go to God and say, God, judge me. I'm, I'm looking at my life. I'm looking at myself. I'm judging my life. And Lord, I just want to make sure that I'm operating in integrity. I just want to make sure that, you know, I'm operating in, in the way that you would have me operate. I want to make sure that I'm doing things on, on purpose the way you would have me to do these things on purpose. Show me, Lord. Show me myself. Show me my heart. And God will do that for you. So how often do you do that? So when you say God knows my heart, it should be in an area where because God knows your heart and because he knows the integrity of your heart, he quickens your spirit and he convicts your spirit so that you'll know he's not condemning you. He's just convicting you. So you'll know, okay, something's not right here. I'm not feeling right in my spirit. Something's not right. So let me, let me check and let me double check and make sure I get on my course. And if you do that, God will make sure that he keeps you on. Cause he's going to do his part. Amen. Okay. So established by integrity, not only will God, so does that make sense? We talked about Abimelech and we saw how, you know, because of the integrity of his heart, God corrected him in a dream. He was, he didn't know he was going based on what they said. But God showed him that basically they were lying. So not, and and let me say this, see, because, because I like to put things in modern day vernacular and and put things in modern terms and in, in today's society, that's just like when people meet you, they don't know we've got, we, it's so unfortunate that we're living in a society where integrity is such a, There's such a lack of integrity. And those of us who walk in integrity have become such the minority that when people meet us, even though we're telling the truth, although we're being honest, they don't know. So oftentimes I don't even get upset anymore because I now understand that they just have to hang out and wait and see because they really don't know all they're doing is basing you on everybody else that's come in their direction everybody else who've come down come in their path acted as though they walk integrity looked as though they walk integrity spoke for a while as though they talk and they walk in integrity only to learn that it was all a lie and that's why you have to be consistent You have to be consistent in your walk in integrity. Even though it's not popular, you do it anyway. Even though it's going to be difficult sometimes, you do it anyway. So, established by integrity. Not only will integrity guide you, but it will help you accomplish the goals and the tasks. Let's go to 1 King, and we're going to look at chapter 9.
first king chapter nine verse four and five and if thou wilt walk before me as david thy father walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that i have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and my judgment then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. The first thing God told Solomon, If thou walk before me in integrity of heart, integrity comes from the heart you know we we're living in the day of all size churches small churches medium churches and mega churches i don't have an issue with mega churches i'm a member of a mega church and the truth of the matter is mega churches can do th a lot of things that smaller churches may or may not be able to do so I have no issue with mega churches, but but I'm using that as an example because for the past 20 years, that's been my that that that's been my experience. Mega church, that's been my experience. It wasn't when I started, but it is now. So what I you know you're living if you're going to if you're involved with any church that where there are more than two people, you're living in a fool's paradise if you think. That out of 20,000 people, 30,000 people, 40 people, 100 people, everybody in there are going to be people of integrity. Everybody in there is going to walk up right the way they're supposed to. See, the thing about today's churches and the thing about people today is, you know, there are people who've hung around enough to know the lingo. Hung around enough to know the talk, to know the walk, to know the shout, to know the whatever is going on in that particular church. So that's why integrity has to be a consistent thing. It has to be consistent in every area of your life. Because I, I know, you know, that some churches, sometimes people act like they're in corporate America, which is which is shameful enough. But, you know, they they only do the right thing if certain leadership is around. Their attitude is only a certain way if certain leadership is around. They only want to do the operating the functions that's going to put them up front because they want to be seen. They want to be popular or, or basically the, uh, the same situations and the same things you deal with in corporate America. Now, unfortunately, it's going on in the church and that cannot be. That has got to stop because the first thing God told Solomon is if thou walk before me in integrity of heart. Integrity comes from the heart. It's a heart issue. And as Christians, we cannot afford to walk around having heart attacks because out of the issues of the out of out of, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the the issues of life flow out of the heart flows the issues of life. So everything at the end of the day is a heart matter. And integrity is the same thing. Integrity is no different. So now we're going to pursue and we're going to be preserved by integrity. Let's go to Psalms ch chapter 25. And we are going to look at ver um, chapter 25. We're going to start with verse 2. And we're going to look at verse 2 and I think 21. But let's just get there first. Okay, I knew something was going on lumpy in my Bible. Now it's turning better. I couldn't figure out what was going on there. Okay, Psalms chapter 25, verse 2. Oh my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Now look at verse 21. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Integrity will preserve you from your enemies. Integrity will, integrity will preserve you from strife. Integrity will preserve you from debt. Integrity will preserve you from hatred. 
Integrity will preserve you from everything that is not of God. Integrity will preserve you from everything that may be harmful in your life and in your children's life. Integrity will preserve you from a life of calamity. If you don't believe me, just try it. You know, the thing about it is you've dealt so long opposite of integrity that you have no idea. You have no idea how freeing it is. You have no idea what it's like to just, if somebody say, can you be that for? And you say, yes, they don't question it. You have no idea that when you repeat an incident or something that happens, the individuals that you're talking to, they don't even question it because they know, yeah, you know, if she's paraphrasing, she'll say, well, I'm paraphrasing. If she's uh, giving her opinion, she said, well, you know, I'm giving my opinion. But if she doesn't say any of that, those are the facts. It's not, it's not colored. It's not, nothing is added to it. That's just the way it is. It's like, I, I remember a couple of, a while back, I was having lunch with uh, an acquaintance. And so she got a phone call. Now, to me, it's just lunch. We're not talking business. We're not, uh, we're just laughing and talking and chewing the fat or whatever it's called these days. We No, you know, no big deal. And so she received a phone call. And so the first thing she said was, well, I'm at a luncheon. Now, you know, and I, I didn't think anything of it because I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe that's her, maybe that's her term for folks meeting, getting together just to go and eat um, Thai, Thai food, China, you know. So she, so she proceeded and continued the conversation. So I'm telling you, by the time the conversation was over with whoever she was talking to on the phone, it sounded as if we were at this huge, beautiful, elaborate place with, you know, the at lunchtime with the cotton tablecloths and the fine china and the cotton napkins and, you know, the beautiful crystal glasses with uh, maitre d's walking around with the napkins across their arms. That, that's what I pictured by the time she finished. And here we are sitting in this little bitty, you know, corner Thai restaurant. That's it. That's all it was. So, you know, I'm thinking this is not a luncheon. And I said that because then I just, I would just say stuff that when people used to do things and say things, I didn't know how to just let it go or it's not worth bringing up. It's not worth mentioning. It's their issue. They got to fix it. I would just say, that you. why did you do that? Why did you, you know, why did you paint this to be bigger than it is? If you're sitting down in a restaurant without a tablecloth, and it's a paper napkin and plastic spoons and forks. You're probably not at a at a rest. You, it's probably not a luncheon that you're having, and but and everybody's in casual clothes, including the two of you. It's probably not a luncheon. So that you know, that's one of those things that people feel like they have to exaggerate a story in order to be more important. And all it is just a, it's just stemming from insecurities. You know, we're living in a society, especially in bigger cities. The bigger cities, the bigger the city is, the more you experience this kind of thing. That everybody has to paint this picture of, you know, being wealthy, financially wealthy already. Everybody has to paint this picture of um, just making everything bigger than it is. You may as well be honest. It's okay. It's not. It's just not. It's just not that deep, in my opinion. So, you know, that's that's just the thing about integrity. Just be honest. It's not that difficult. Just be honest. Just be straightforward. Be direct. Be humble, and you're on your way. Amen. Okay. So, where are we? Psalms twenty six and one. We did that already. Okay. And then turn to, okay. Okay, we're gonna to go to Psalms twenty six and one because we're gonna we're gonna talk about how trusting in the Lord is intricately tied together with walking in integrity. So let's just look at that. Let's look at Psalms since we're there already. Psalms twenty six verse one. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. The promise of God is clear. You trust him. You walk in integrity. And he'll make sure you never slide. He will up, you, you're, you will be upheld by integrity. And that's an important thing. It's important... When you get to a position, when you get in a do or die position and you think, okay, the only way out of this is to 
lie, but you know you've made the decision to walk in integrity, so you respond in integrity, and you respond honest even when it looks like it's not going to work out for your benefit, there's nothing like when you think something is going to go one way when you tell the truth, but you tell the truth anyway, and you see how God moves and turn that whole thing around, there's no feeling like it whatsoever. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you will become doing it. The more you do it, what you ultimately recognize is, you know what, here's the thing. If I tell the truth, God has my back. And he's more than the world against me. But if I lie, I'm on my own. And anything may happen. Because who is because who is who is the father of lies? Satan. So when you start lying and when you start operating outside of integrity, you're basically playing on his ground. And if you read the word of God carefully and if you continue to read, you know, if you play on his ground, Satan's ground, that is the ultimate end is destruction. So you may as well go on and walk in integrity and just see how God can handle things. And I'm, tell, and I'm telling you from experience, he will handle things. I've been in situations before and I'm sitting there like, oh, God, well, I know this is it. But, you know, I'm just going to tell the truth. That's all I got. I'm going to tell the truth. I tell the truth and I come out victorious every time. Every time, because your integrity will uphold you and you want to be upheld by integrity. Now, I'm running out of time. So let's just go to Psalms 41. And I'm going to try and get through this today because we have some exciting things coming up for August. Psalms 41 and 12. I will praise thee, O Lord, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name evermore. Again, God will uphold you in your integrity. And, and, th and here's the thing about this part, because I was about to say, why did I read that? But this is why. Because when you're walking in integrity, and this is, this is the thing that I had to learn. You're walking in integrity, so you know God has your back. But your attitude and the spirit in which you operate in, in integrity is so important. I remember, you know, growing up, I, I think about different phases in my life, and I always look at the motive behind what I do. I judge the motive behind what I do. That's why other people can't judge me, because I consistently judge myself. So I look at why I do what I do. And when I was a little girl, I was honest, because I didn't want to disappoint my grandmother. So she always knew, you know, I would, I would hear, I, you know, when, when I was growing up, we were not allowed to be involved or around or part of adult conversations. But because of the way our house was built, I could sit on a hallway and nobody would know I was there. And it's not that I did it often. It's just usually I either wanted something to eat or I wanted to do something that I needed to ask my grandmother. And so I would come out of my room and by the time I would come down the hallway, turn and go down the other hallway. And by the time I would get to the living room where she and her guests were, I could hear conversation. And I, I remember hearing this adult say one time, well, you know, you never know what children would do. and You never know what these kids will and won't do these, these days. And my grandmother said, I know I can tell you what Nisi will. And I'm, I was I'm Nisi, what Nisi will and what Nisi will not do. And she had so much confidence in the fact that I was I was going to do the right thing and I would always do the right thing. That guess what? I did the right thing. So growing up, I didn't do certain things, and I was honest because I didn't want to disappoint my grandmother. But by the time I got to college, my attitude was, I may as well tell the truth. You can't do anything to me. And so I was kind of haughty. You know, I had a haughty attitude. My attitude was, yeah, I'm going to tell the truth because you can't do a thing about it. Well, that's not the right attitude. So as life went on and I grew, and I grew spiritually, I learned, okay, you tell the truth because it's a, it's a heart matter. You tell the truth because it's a part of walking in integrity. But you don't tell the truth because you feel the other person, you know, can't do anything anyway. You just tell the truth because you, you do what's right because it's right. And that's ultimately, that's the ultimate goal is we all just want to be more Christ-like. Isn't that the ultimate goal is to be like Christ? And he's not who he is because he feel like you can't do anything about it anyway. You know, if, if, if God, cause you know, you think about things like God making us free mortal agents, he could have easily said, you know what? You will praise me. We wouldn't have had a choice, 
But he's not that kind of God. And I say it before and I'll say it again because if you're forced to do something, it doesn't mean a whole lot. If you're the only person left, if you're the only female left on earth and the guy come over and say, I choose you, well, you shouldn't smile a whole lot because he doesn't have any choices. So it's all the choice is where the value comes into it. So when you choose to walk in integrity and you walk in character and you walk in integrity, then the power and the pleasing is in the choosing. So I'm going to move on real quick. It doesn't look like I'm going to get through this. So basically, when as you walk in integrity and as you choose that you're going to live this life of character, you want to do it with sweet lips. You know, you want to do it with the humble attitude. You don't want to treat people as if you can't do it. You can't do anything about it anyway. So, yeah, I'm going to tell the truth because what you're going to do. That's not the way you want to do it. You know, you want to be bettered by integrity. You don't want to be haughty by integrity. You want to be bettered by integrity. And let's look real quick at Proverbs 19.1 because I have a feeling this is going to be my last scripture for today. And I apologize because I really wanted to get through this. I didn't want to carry you through another long... Um, <laughs> series but I enjoy series and I, I've said to you before and I'll say it again my calling of the fivefold ministry is teaching and evangelist and the teaching part can be very dry because it's one of those things that you have to learn you have to listen and you have to read and I'm going to tell you right now I knew when I got up to talk about integrity that it was not going to be a popular topic I knew when I got up to talk about integrity that a lot of people weren't going to laugh or smile or clap or anything like that because it causes you to look at yourself. But what I want you to know is when you start really operating in integrity, it's so much fun. I had a friend tell me one time, she, and, we, and we were very close friends, and she said, this was, this was maybe three years ago, and I'm not a New Year's, New Year's resolution person. I mean, when I see the need to make a change, I make the adjustment, I make the change, I move forward. It doesn't matter what time of year it is. So she and I were talking one day, and she was telling me about a friend of ours that she had bumped into. And so she was she was talking to him about a house. And she, I said, well, did you describe the house? She said, you know what? And I didn't even know she had this issue. I'll be honest with you. She said, you know what, Ovetta? She said, girl, she said, I wanted to so bad. She said, but the house is big enough. She said, but by the time I got through talk, talking to him about it, I would have made it bigger than the whole block. She said, so I just decided, instead of me lying, I'm just not going to even do it. I just tell him, yeah, everybody's fine. And she said, I just got out of there. And I, I, I laughed so hard because... I never knew she exaggerated. I never knew she stretched the truth. And so when I finished laughing, I said, really, you do that? She said, girl, yes, if you only knew. She said, honey, I'll take a house that's about maybe 2,000 square feet, 3,000 max. And by the time I finish with it, she said, it'll cover the whole block and it'll have several different floors. And she just went on to describe all the things that would have in it. And I just could, all I could do was laugh because here's the power in that. She had made the decision to change. The other side of that is I never knew she was that way anyway. And I guess that's what made it so funny. But the power of integrity. So I'm going to read this one last scripture and then we're going to close and we're going to pick back up on this um, next week. What did I say? Proverbs 19 and 1. Let's look at that really quick, and this is where we're going to close. Just give me about two more minutes, and we'll get and we'll I'll let you out of here. Proverbs 19 and 1. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Basically, what's being said here is God will see that you are bettered as a result of your wa walking integrity and integrity. In other words, you may start out poor, but you won't end poor. It's an upward progression. You may start off stuttering, but you won't end stuttering. It's an upward progression. You may start out sickly, but you won't end sickly. It's an upward progression. You may start out not understanding everything mentally, but you won't end up mentally slow. It's an upward progression. When you're walking in integrity, everything you do, Everything that you touch will prosper. It may not start out that way, but as you continue, you'll end that way. Because I'm telling you, the word of God talks about you're blessed in the city, you're blessed in the field, you're blessed coming out, you're blessed coming in. When the, the faster you walk in integrity, the quicker you will see that happen. You will see 
your enemy rise up against you, but as you continue to walk in integrity, they will fall. They they may rise up on your right and your left, but all these things will not come nigh you. Why? Because you walk in integrity. Now, here's the difficult part, and this is what I want to say. I got to make sure that I can help you get through the week. So this is what you want. This is what you want to watch, and this is what makes it difficult. When you're swimming upstream and everybody else is swimming downstream, you're swimming against the current. So because you are a minority swimming against the current, it's going to be more difficult because it just makes sense that if you swim in the direction that everybody else is swimming in, things are going to be easy. After all, that's going to be the flow of the water. That's going to be the flow of the stream. It's going to be more power going in that way because you have more people going in that way. So more th- more, you're going to be understood more. But if you continue in integrity, God has your back. You're going to hit a lot of rough spots. But if you just continue on in integrity in the end, you're going to win. And it will not take that long because you're continuing to be better and better and better and better. I love you so much. And God loves you so much. And I thank you for joining us today. Thank you, MyRockBoutique.com a sponsor for here, here, us here at Established Heart Ministries. And we just love you. And we will see you next week. I want to just encourage you and to empower you to walk and to operate in integrity. You will not be disappointed. God loves you. He's going to love you regardless. But we, at the end, at, in the end, what do we want to do? What do we want? We want to be just like him. God bless you. Amen. Jesus. I love you.